Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Drake Mullins here. Today, I want to discuss with you the three most important factors to success within the capstone simulation. Those factors include, first, giving consumers what they want. Second, accurately forecasting and producing to that forecast. And third, planning for the future. So let's talk about these individually, beginning with giving consumers what they want. In my opinion, this is the most important factor associated with success in the simulation. Why is that? If you don't produce sensors that consumers want to buy, that are aligned with their buying preferences, it doesn't matter what else you do in the simulation because you don't have sensors consumers want. So how do you produce sensors that consumers actually want? Well, first within the R&D function, you need to have the performance, size, and mean time before failure aligned with the consumer's buying preferences. Associated with that is the perceived age of the sensor, which we'll talk about momentarily, and then also adjusting the price to the segment specifications within the marketing function. On the right, we see our perceptual map. We have the low-end segment, the traditional segment, the high-end segment, the size segment, and then also the performance segment. The same procedure should be followed for each one of these segments. For the purpose of discussion, I'm going to look at the traditional segment and our ABLE product competing within that segment. So how do I know what consumers want? I can go to the capstone courier and look at those individual segments. So let's look at the traditional segment. Within the traditional segment, we see consumers are concerned with age, price, ideal position, and reliability. We then see the relative importance of each of those criteria when consumers are making purchases. In the traditional segment, the perceived age represents 47% of the buying decision. The ideal age is two. I would also encourage you to verify that you're looking at the right segment. We see indeed, this is for our ABLE product. So 47% of the buying decision is based on having the correct perceived age. Consumers want a perceived age of two years. So if we look at our R&D function, at the bottom, we have the age profile. We see that our ABLE product at the beginning of the year is perceived to be 3.1 years old. At the end of the year, it's going to be 4.1 years old. So what do consumers want? A perceived age at two, of two. We're currently well above that, and by the end of the year, we're going to be twice that. So how do you adjust the perceived age? Any change to the performance or the size of the sensor, no matter how big or how small, will change the perceived age by half. It will be cut in half. So for the purpose of cutting the age and just for this demonstration, I'm going to make a very small change to that ABLE product. I'm going to adjust the performance of the sensor from 5.5 to 5.6. I'm recalculating now. Simulation is a little slow. So we can see that the move on the perceptual map is very, very small. But we also observe that the age is being cut in half for that sensor. Before the end of the year, it's going to be the ideal perceived age, and that represents 47% of consumers' purchase decision. When actually making this adjustment, I would encourage you to strategically think about where you want to move the sensor amongst your group and then you know, plan for that because we also have to consider the ideal spot within each of these segments. So it's not as simple as just making this small revision, but to adjust the age, it is that simple for this demonstration. Also, when you're making changes, whether it's to the specifications of your sensor, whether it's to the marketing of your sensors, whatever the case may, B, I would encourage you to consider what happens to your estimated cells. And we can get our estimated cells under our marketing function. So our ABLE product is currently 
estimated to sell, based on the bench park prediction, 896,000 units. As I talked about previously, the benchmark prediction is not particularly accurate because it assumes standard mediocre competitors with mediocre sensors. However, it is valuable for experimentation. In this case, we're experimenting with changing the age of the sensor. So we're only changing that factor and we're going to determine what it does to our estimated cells. So remember, we're currently estimated, based on the benchmark prediction, to sell 896,000 units of ABLE. We'll go back to R&D and make that adjustment, simply changing the performance from 5.5 to 5.6, recalculating, Going back to marketing to determine what it did to our benchmark prediction. Wow. Simply by barely changing the performance of that sensor, but cutting the age of that sensor in half, our benchmark prediction went from 896,000 units to 2.175 million units. We didn't take a look at our performance metrics over here on the right, but I can assure you that they dramatically increased by more than doubling our cells for that segment. Also, when you're looking at the capstone courier, also note that the capstone courier is from the previous year. So when you're thinking about changes within the segment, you're in the current year. So another thing to note is that the price that consumers are willing to pay is decreasing by 50 cents every year. So you need to bear in mind that when adjusting the price of your sensors. So the first most important thing to do in the simulation, give consumers what they want. Here, I only demonstrated giving consumers what they want within the traditional segment on the perceived age. Whereas we can go through the other segments and make these adjustments now. Now we're looking at the low end customer buying criteria. So we have the same four buying criteria, but note the relative importance of those buying criteria have changed. Price is now the most important uh, factor when. Uh, deciding whether to make a purchase. It represents 53% of the buying decision. Age is now only 24% and our reliability is 7%. So think about each one of these individually. You can ensure that your price is falling within that segment and your acre is your low end product. You know, what happens if I decrease my price? We're about, we're slightly above the middle uh, point within that range of 15 to 25 dollars what does it do to my cells if i go to 19 dollars we're at 1.332 million by reducing our price we go to 1.746 million you can determine if this is prudent by looking at what it does to your profitability or you can make adjustments to your marketing. So let's say we bump our marketing up to 2 million. That takes us to 1.998 million. And so it's giving you a rough estimate of what's going to happen to your total sales for that sensor when you're making these adjustments. So is that good to spend this additional money on our promotional budget and gain these additional sales. Well, you have information available to you to make that decision. So on our production page, we see exactly how much it's costing us to produce each sensor. On our marketing page, we see what we're charging for that sensor. $19 and it was $15.45 that it cost a cent to uh, produce it. So we're making $3.55 on every sensor we sell. Are these additional cells covering the cost of our increased promotional budget? You can make that determination. So you shouldn't be making these decisions blindly within the simulation. 
I would go through each of the functions, sorry, each of the segments, and ensure you're giving customers what they want. Also, consider the relative importance of that criterion. So if our reliability for our traditional segment is only 9% of their purchase decision. The mean time before failure range is 14,000 to 19,000 hours. On our R&D page, we have that information available to us. Our ABLE product is in the upper end of that range at 17,500. So mean time before it failure is your reliability. How many hours on average will the sensor perform before it fails? So in this case, perhaps you could consider reducing your mean time before failure. And why would you want to do this? Because it's not that important to consumers. You're in the upper end of the range, and by reducing that, although you'll have a cost for the revision, it's going to reduce your unit cost because you're using lower quality inputs that don't cost as much. So as an example of this, let's say we want to reduce it to 14,000 hours, the bottom of the range and look at our materials costs for ABLE. And our new materials cost decreased by just over a dollar per sensor. Why is this important? Because that's a dollar that was previously going to materials, that's now going to go into your pockets as profits. And again, you can see what it does to your benchmark prediction. Unfortunately, I didn't write down the most recent benchmark prediction, but we can see that it has decreased slightly. So bear those things in mind and go through each of the buying criteria for each of your products and determine if it's important, determine if you should make adjustments to it. The next most important factor to success within this capstone simulation is accurately forecasting and producing to that forecast. So we've drawn your attention to the benchmark prediction, but as I noted, the benchmark prediction isn't reliable. It's not going to produce a consistently good estimate of how many units you sell because it's not taking into consideration what your rivals are actually doing and assumes they have mediocre products. Within the simulation, your performance is going to be partly dependent on the decisions you make, but also partly dependent on the decisions your rivals make. So think about competing against Amazon. You're starting a new firm. It's going to be challenging. Amazon has a sound strategy, they're constantly innovating, and they have a lot of resources to you know, throw at any competitive moves the rivals may take. Whereas if you're competing against a weaker competitor, it's going to be easier. Within the simulation, it's a closed industry. So there are six firms competing. You're competing for a finite number of consumers. For you to grow, you're going to have to take sales from a, an existing uh, firm in the industry. If there's a very strong firm in the industry, it's going to be more difficult. They're going to be seeking to take sales from you. And that's within a single round. As I hope you're aware by now, each segment of the industry has an individual growth rate. So you can grow over time by capitalizing on the growing demand within the industry. But within a single uh, round or a single year, the only way to grow is through but taking cells from existing firms. So how do you arrive at a good forecast? Your player's guide gives you a few options for forecasting. I think as a beginning point, you should look at how many sensors you sold last round. So we have that information available to you.
you can look within the dominant market in which it competes and see how many units you sold to that segment. You also need to be aware that the product may sell to other segments. And here, the product information, I believe, gives you the total sales, but you can use the control func the F function to determine if it was selling in other segments. But you sold 314 units of that product. It's primarily competing in the size segment. So we can go to the size segment, which we'll click on here. We see that the growth rate for that segment is 18.3%. So if you sold 307,000 units last round, all else held constant based on the growth rate, you can expect to sell 307 plus 18.3%. So you can take 1.183 times the 307 units to get your baseline estimate for this round sells. If you're making adjustments in R&D or if you're making adjustments in marketing, then consider the change in that benchmark prediction. So we saw that we're expected to sell vastly more in our traditional product because we revised the size of that sensor, then take into consideration how many additional units that benchmark prediction is saying you're going to sell, and you can add it to the calculation you just did, the growth rate times the unit sales for that segment. It becomes more complicated when you have products that are competing in multiple segments. You can uh, do the calculations in a similar fashion. You just need to determine in which segments it is competing and that information is available to you within the player's guide. Why is forecasting important? It's very important, firstly, because It's driving your performance estimates. So if we look at our finance page, our estimated cash balance at the end of the year is based on how many units we say we're going to sell or forecast we're going to sell, and then also how many units we actually produce. Also, it's important to note the interrelationships across the functions. You can't change something and then look at the effects in isolation. As an example of this, if I forecast I'm going to sell 2.8 million units, but I only produce 1,000 units, what that, what's that going to do to my performance estimates? It's going to be quite bad because I'm producing, say I'm going to sell 2.8 million units, and if I only produce 1 million units, then I can only have performance estimates based on 1 million units. I'm not actually going to be able to sell that higher number because I don't have the sensors available. So you have to make the interrelated changes before looking at the effect on your performance. Another way to consider this is think about my own life. Let's say I like to spend money. And so next year for 2018, I develop a budget of around compensation of $1 million. Wow, it's a lot of money. I'll be able to spend a lot of money. I should be able to buy a lot of things in 2018. So I developed this budget around million, $1 million. 2018 rolls around and I begin spending to this budget. What's going to happen to me? Well, I'm not going to make $1 million next year, unfortunately. So I'm going to run out of money very fast. I'll probably find myself in bankruptcy. The same holds true when you're developing forecasts within the simulation. You need to base it on reality, how many you actually can sell. So if I put, let's say, 4 million units forecasted for my ABLE product, I'm going to recalculate, keep your eye on the right-hand column. Wow, we have now tripled our contribution margin less promo and sales. Very wonderful. 
The problem is this is only a dream. It's a fantasy. It's artificial. You aren't going to sell these actual units, so your performance estimates are going to be way off. If you actually produce to that forecast of that fantasy forecast of 4 million units, you're going to have even more problems because you're going to produce sensors that you can't sell. So you're paying for the materials for those sensors. You're paying your employees to transform those sensors into a finished product, and then you don't have anyone to buy them. They aren't generating any revenue for you. And importantly, within the simulation, you're going to be penalized for an inventory carrying cost in addition to the effect that it's going to have on your cash estimates, you're probably going to end up with an emergency loan. In the real world, that would probably be rank bankruptcy if you couldn't find an injection of cash. So forecasting is very important for your success. In addition, when you over forecast and over produce, it creates problems for rounds going forward. And we're going to jump to the production page now. It creates problems for future rounds because we see that the second line under production is inventory on hand. So let's say we produce 4 million units for our ABLE product, but we only sell 2 million. Now we have 2 million units that went unsold in the next round. Therefore, if we're only at 2 million units this year, we're probably going to be just above 2 million units next year. So we would need to halt production on that product. So we would have idle production lines, we would have idle workers, the fixed cost you know, would continue, and we'd be penalized for inventory carrying costs for these unsold sensors. So accurately forecast your sales. I gave you a baseline method to do that if you want a more uh, if you want a different method, I encourage you to read your player's guide. The first line on the production page is our unit sales forecast. When we create a forecast, it becomes the first line. If we don't create a forecast, the benchmark prediction is the first line. We then want to produce plus our inventory on hand to equal our unit sales forecast. So let's say in this hypothetical scenario, we believe we're going, we forecasted 4, mount, 4 million units of ABLE. We already have 189,000 units on sell, so we need to produce an additional 3011, and these figures in, are in thousands. Note that our production after adjustment, the next line doesn't equal our production schedule. Why is this? It's this way because your suppliers may not provide you all the inputs that you need to run your production line, or some of those inputs may be defective, or you may have workers who don't come to work, they aren't at work, you can't produce enough sensors, or you may produce defective sensors on your production line. So your production schedule doesn't exactly equal how many units are available to sell. So your production after adjustment plus your inventory on hand should equal the 4,000. So we've lost here. Let's go. Oh. What's going on here? Sorry. We have another problem. We see that our production schedule has a it's red and it has a line through that. Why is that? Well, we can only produce our first shift capacity plus run a second shift. So the maximum we can produce for this product is 3.6 million, which is a good point to address. We can produce our first shift. We can also run a second shift. So we can actually produce twice our first shift capacity. 
So the maximum we can produce this year is 3,600 after adjustment, 3,565. If you find yourself in a situation where you can't meet demand for your product, it's probably a good indication that you want to buy additional capacity. But that capacity is not going to be available until the next round. It takes one year to construct the capacity and begin to produce on it. So in the short term, you don't want to have consumers that want to buy your product but not have the product available. So think of it like this. Let's say GM makes a special edition pickup. They're only making uh, 100 uh, of these pickups. If they sold it for $1, how many people would want to buy these 100 pickups? A lot, a lot, a lot. But it doesn't matter how many people want to buy it because they only have 100 to sell. So they would want to find the 100 people who were willing to pay the most for this pickup. So how do they do this? They continue to increase the price, increase the price, increase the price until exactly 100 people were willing to buy at this higher price point. So in the simulation, if you have more demand than capacity, it may be a good idea to increase your price so you can find the people who are willing to pay the most for these sensors to maximize profits on the sensors you do have for sale. And we'd go back to marketing, we could play with the price. Here we have a unit sales forecast. And again, these are, this is just a hypothetical situation. I strongly encourage you to develop your own forecast. So we have 39 units on hand. So we would want our production after adjustment this line plus our inventory on hand to equal our unit sales forecast and it takes some playing around with to get it exactly correct because our production after adjustment doesn't equal how many we're actually producing so this is not perfect but you see the process of adjusting your production to get your production after adjustment plus your inventory on hand equal your unit sales forecast. Here we're producing slightly too many. Um, you could make further adjustments to get it perfect if you so wish. Now I'm going to move on to the third most important factor, and that is planning for the future. Often I see individuals who are worried about their performance today. They open up their pro forma balance scorecard, which I'm going to do here, it's a little slow, sorry, and see, wow, I'm not earning points on customer awareness, I'm not earning points on customer accessibility, I'm earning few points on employee turnover, my contribution margin is earning me zero points. So they're making frantic adjustments to these different areas to play to the balance scorecard. The problem with this is you aren't creating long-term value. So Apple recently introduced the iPhone 10, and let's say they didn't make adjustments to the iPhone 10 or introduce a new product for the next five years. What's going to happen? Cells are going to dry up. Competitors are going to continue to innovate and take cells from Apple. Within the simulation, if you don't improve, you're going to get worse. Complacency breeds failure. So you need to strategically plan for the future. Think about how I'm going to be more profitable next round than I am this round. How am I going to be more profitable seven rounds from now than I am this round? You have options available to you. In production, you can automate your production lines, which I talk more in depth about in another video. In round two, you have the HR module available where you can invest in recruiting higher quality employees or training those employees. In round four, you have TQM become available where you can invest in a variety of initiatives to increase demand or lower your cost. You can also create new products. So you should think about how you're going to create value. You know, if this firm increases their automation from four to nine, Four was the baseline, they're increasing it to nine, that's reducing their labor costs by 50%. How are you gonna compete with a firm that has 
50% lower labor cost. It's going to be difficult because of those cost advantages. Sure, there are other strategies available to you, but you should be aware of how you're going to be more profitable next time or how you're going to innovate. Also, I'd encourage you to take action early. Investing in automation in the first round or second round is vastly different than investing in automation in the seventh round. Firstly, you're going to have the opportunity to amortize the cost across multiple rounds. And secondly, you're going to be able to reap the benefits across multiple rounds. Sure, if you find yourself in a situation where you don't invest early because you're risk adverse, there's still opportunities to create value later on. But you're going to create more value for your organization by taking these actions early. I'll conclude with repeating, complacency breeds failure. You have to take action now. You can't let the simulation run for five rounds and then think, oh, I'm going to make revisions and improve in the fifth round. The problem is that there is path dependency. You can't change your course of action overnight. If you have all the sensors that have drifted out of the segments, it's going to take time to get new good products or revise those existing products. So that concludes the discussion on the three most important factors to success within the capstone simulation. I also want to briefly note a bonus factor. And the bonus factor is often under considered within the simulation. But if I look at my time teaching the capstone business course, business strategy, and utilizing simulations, I often note that high performing teams are separated from low performing teams due in part to group dynamics. How well do you work together? Are you cohesive? Can you collaborate and make effective decisions? Often the high performing teams have this cohesiveness. They work together to create good decisions. Whereas low performing teams can be characterized by internal conflict. And that conflict detracts from effort, motivation, and making good decisions within the simulation. I can't force cohesiveness on you. I can't force collaboration on you. Social engineering within this online course or within my face-to-face -face courses or within a real organization is often beyond the capabilities of the leader. And certainly in this online class, I don't have that capability. So I'm encouraging you as an individual to take the time to understand the simulation. When you understand the simulation, you can be a contributing member of the capstone simulation. You're going to increase the value of your experience but also of your group mates experience so it has that benefit in the capstone simulation and finally it's going to benefit you as an individual when you complete the comp xm which is an individual simulation that is very similar with the capstone simulation similar to the capstone simulation with that i will conclude if you have any questions don't hesitate to contact me i am here to facilitate your success thank you